<laughs> we got a monkey. <laughs> what oh, to Jurassic Park. <laughs> That has nothing to do with our theme this week. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Welcome to Dinosaur Talk, episode one. <laughs> we switched the podcast after the the incredible amount of feedback from our first episode, the hate mail that Brandon received. <laughs> uh, we just want to apologize to everybody. <laughs> My mom read some of that. I swear to God. She, she wept. Yeah. Um, She's a healthcare worker. You should feel bad. You should feel real bad. Yeah. The the scum we had to face after that first episode. <sighs> Anyways, welcome back to episode two. <laughs> I'm your host, Ethan. One of your hosts. I'm Brandon. I'm Chris. And uh, we're back at it again. Episode two. Boys, how we doing? What's the vibe like? We're we're two we're two episodes in. Well, no, Are you sick of me yet. We're one episode in, but we're working on number two. Oh, there's the contrarian Brandon. He's back. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. <laughs> I will end the show right now. No, please don't. <laughs> you hear that? The end music is playing right now. No, we <laughs> already recorded a minute and forty two seconds. It, well, that's how long the podcast is going to be. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no but chris how are you wait i want to hear what happened this week um things have been good um things in hong kong have been i mean pretty much the same as they have been the last couple of weeks i mean there's still like um protests going on but people at least i think for, for the most part people are still being cautious about um you know going out and whatnot but at the same time like life is starting to resume back to a normal which is you know very reassuring at least Given, you know, uh, albeit uh, things around the world are still kind of crazy, especially what's going on between Korea and India and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, like, everything's been fine, at least on my end. <laughs> How about you guys? Arizona has hit, like, the highest per capita coronavirus cases. So I'm trying to stay inside as much as possible and watch as many movies as possible, as evident by my letterbox. 21 fucking movies in six days. Seven, seven days. Seven days. 21? Yeah. So Honestly Brandon, worth it. So Brandon, you've seen, in the last week, you've seen three times the movies I have, because I've seen seven. Yes. Oh. I'm tired. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, I watched, um, what's it? I watched the few, like, Siberian movies, which was really cool. Like, I don't know about Siberian? Much. Yeah. Like, the uh, epic Siberian movies. Like two and a half hours long, longer, and they're awesome. So if you have a chance, check out Underground by Amir Kursteriska or something like that. Wow, pretty good. And then, shut up. <laughs> yeah, do your research before you present on movies, bud. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I already watched it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so, uh, what else? <laughs> now right. I have to do research. You made me lose my place. Uh, I watched Solaris, a Tarkovsky movie. I watched Funny Games. It was three hours. Yeah, it is. I watched. I a tried lot watching it. I didn't know it was three hours. I started it. I was like, "This is three hours. I gotta do. I gotta do homework." So well, what are you supposed to do during quarantine? You know. Well, this was during school, so. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. I've been uh. Until the end of the world, a five-hour movie. Nice. That was that was tough though. Was that the one you gave five stars? The one about like a uh, an apartment complex? Oh, not no. well. Like I don't know. you gave a five star movie a little bit ago. It was a long movie about like people in a uh, in like a building complex in like Poland or something. I don't know. <laughs> if I look at your every hand, let me find. Ringing it. a bell? No. I well, I did Poland. watch a Polish movie, but I gave that one star. So, man, if I doesn't yeah, give me like a second. How about you, Ethan? What do you watch anything good lately? Um, ooh, I watched the latest Spike Lee joint, The Five Bloods. Okay. Boys, let me tell you that that's my favorite movie of the year so far. I know it's a very competitive year in terms of releases. Yeah, no, I, but really, this one's I like, really like this the one, Sonic movie. Hey, that's my number two. You shut up. <laughs> it was a close second. No, but The Five Bloods blew me away. Like, 
I didn't really know what to expect, like a Spike Lee Vietnam War movie, but like, oh, it beat the shit out of me. Really? Took, did yes. it like get out the screen and went? <gasps> yes, it did. Oh. It picked me up like the fucking Lorax and kicked my ass out into the doghouse in the backyard. <laughs> Brutal movie, but like, I definitely, especially with everything that's going on today, I recommend it. Like, woof. And I'd recommend my three-hour movie, the Polish, not the Polish. The yeah, Soviet you don't even movie. know what it's called, Dingus. Underground. It's called Underground. Uh, you want to hear what it's about? You made that up. Nope. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Ha. <laughs> What's it about? Yeah, uh, it's like this movie about these people in World War II who go to a bunker in Serbia, and one of the guys who's like in charge of that bunker gets injured and they throw him in there too and his friend instead of letting them know the war is over begins to war profiteer off of the people living in the bunker and continues to tell them that it's world war ii still so for years they oh, live wow. in the bunker and it's amazing it's not a true story i don't think so i don't so think i'm allowed so. to call it an epic prank then yeah i would say <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> i mean the trouble. war is real the war is real so <laughs> Chris does not believe in wars <laughs> ever. Okay, Chris, what did you watch this week? Come on. Um, so I watched um, seven films. I try and do one each day. Um, I did get a little bit complacent in terms of like trying to find like new stuff to watch. So I did two rewatches this week. Um, I rewatched Tarzan and Curmudgeons. Um, Danny DeVito, I feel like, is actually a pretty solid director. I feel like he, if he wanted, he might be able to do a feature. Um, I watched two A24 films, Krisha and A Ghost Story. Yeah, um, those are both amazing. Um, I, Ethan, I finally saw The Great Beauty. Oh, yes. I uh, haven't seen it. Yeah. Greg, and, you got to watch it. Holy yeah. shit. Italian cinema and me don't mix. No, Sorry this for one, our Italian listeners. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. one will mix. Yeah, I've Chris, you got to agree with me, right? Yeah, honestly, this one's pretty good. I watched like two Italian movies. I've given above a three stars. So <laughs> Italians. <laughs> unsubscribe <laughs> um Brandon, i found that movie that i thought you watched um well um it, but i it's i just checked it turns out you watched this over two weeks ago the quarantine has like made my brain fuse days together so the movie is called satan tango satan tango yeah that movie's amazing yeah seven it's hours awesome. long jesus christ yeah <laughs> it's, uh, it took me two or three sittings to get through, so I'll do it in one. You want to? Go ahead. Yep. Try it. <laughs> get my. There's only 150 shots in that entire movie. That means an average. Wait, what? Seven divided by 150. What am I doing? I can't fucking do 80. Math. That's 80 shots per. Right. Here on the Stack Podcast, we don't. We do can't math do math anymore. though. Anyway, we don't. we don't need to do math anymore. We took our math G's. And we're good for the rest of our lives. I, mean, I almost failed our math G. <laughs> we did. I, I got a C plus. I somehow got an A minus, and I did. I shouldn't have. Oh, cool. We're talking about grades. Anyway, yeah, this is fun. We get, let's go over our spring 2020 report cards on the podcast. <laughs> no. uh, I passed. I got all A's. I got to say A's. that. Okay. <laughs> everyone, knows, everyone knows that's not true, but okay. You believe what you want to believe. <laughs> All right, leave it up. To, we'll leave it up to the listeners. Ethan, do you want to explain a little bit about the show, or have you already done that? I'm I'm tired of it. You're tired I'm of not, it. Okay, I'm not doing this show anymore. Oh, Just kidding. okay. <laughs> okay. So the theme this week is movies about making movies. Um, once a week we set a topic or theme and go our separate ways and construct our own three film stack. Then after a week, we come back here on the podcast and share our own stacks one film at a time. Then at the end of the show, we mix and match our nine films to make the ultimate decision. On... The ultimate decision of what quintessential three film stack we are checking out of this hypothetical video store. That's what we're doing this week. Movies about making movies. The reason why we chose this topic is, fellas, Hollywood's opening up. It's opening up. Theaters are open up. Productions are starting. Yeah. It's uh, 
it's a little little concerning if you ask me mm-hmm. brandon you you're jumping up and down you look excited you're tapping the top of your head you have something to say i can't i can't go to the movies when they reopen why not they're not because they're not reopening where i live oh okay. my, uh, so my, no but how do you how do you feel about it oh i'm happy for everybody else what are they gonna watch though you... tenet oh that's it but i'm california's not ready dog i don't know i'm happy about productions like i hope they like set some sort of rules or regulations but things aren't looking good for movie theaters staying in a condensed room you know chris what do you think yeah um i mean like movie theaters i at least as far as i know in hong kong they didn't close much if at all during this whole thing because i think at least hong kong did a pretty good job with containing it um so like movie theaters are open for business now i'm not sure if i'm i'm sure that they're employing some form of like extra um you know um you know guidelines and whatnot to make sure people are social distancing in the theater and whatnot um i'm pretty excited i i i do want to go to the movies sometime soon um i think the first movie i want to go see is they are doing a re-release of the dark knight over in hong kong um and i've never seen it in theater so I'm really excited to go check that out. And hopefully my friends and I will go to the IMAX theater. So we'll literally get to see it the way Nolan intended, which would be great. Oh, so jealous of you. Mm. Why do you have such an organized health organization in your country? Ooh. It's not fair. It's Ooh. not fair. <laughs> I want to go to a movie theater. Oh. I can't wait because the second that speaker system and projector turns on, I feel like it's going to be like going in a spaceship. Like I'm oh, still yeah. not used to like a good sound system and a good picture now. So it's going to feel like a whole new world. Oh, okay. that's going to be nice. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> things are open up. People are making movies. So today we're going to talk about a, a sort of genre of film, I guess, about making movies. It's a very movies broad about, topic. Movies about making movies. Yeah. If, I guess if the main plot of this movie is about making a movie, then that's how we include it in these stacks. Am I right, gentlemen? Yeah. Uh, I think like, sure. at least in some sure. extent, it has to deal with, I feel like what either, um, it has to like, to some extent, tackle what films represent to people or also just like the actual making of film. So basically it's just like, or even just like a look into what filmmaking as an industry is like. I feel like I feel like this is this category is more broad than you might initially think. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, I do th- I mean I have faith that we have a pretty solid selection. I I split mine into 3 again. Like remember how last week I did with the pandemic movies? Yeah. Uh I I split mine into the research portion, the scripting mm-hmm. portion, and then the the actual like filmmaking filmmaking portion. Right. Interesting. So, I think I, um, I did I did a pattern too. Where okay. oh. I did it by scale of production. Mm. Oh. So I did like low, like I did independent. And then my film is the second film is documentary. Oh, and then wow. The third film is Hollywood. I thought about doing a doc too. Interesting. But I, well, no, th- it's it's a narrative film, but it's about making a documentary. Okay. Oh, okay. Making documentaries. Well, I know so. what that is then. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um i think my lineup i the clip don't from. think mine has much as as much of like a pattern as you guys i think all three of mine are like celebrations of what film means to people and also just like it's i think to some extent they're all very fun actually no i do i would say they're all very fun um but yeah um i think we'll have a fun lineup so should we get started let's get started Chris, you went first last time, so let's do yeah. Brandon this time. Okay. What's your first film in your stack, Brandon? I something to you. Sorry. Uh, that was a loud-ass keyboard. That wasn't me. Uh, so my first film uh, is a movie about the research of writing or making a movie, and that was nineteen. It's from the 1940s called Sullivan's Travels. If either of you heard of it or... Is that related to Gulliver's Travels? I mean, (laughs) kind of. (laughs) Oh, really? You'd be surprised. Well, it's a travel... It's a travel story about this screenwriter-producer who wants to know what it's like to be poor. 
So he goes on the road to try and like understand what it's like so that he can make a a movie adaptation of the book Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Mm. And it's a comedy about that. And I think it's a really fantastic portrayal of like what what people try and do to get into roles or try and figure out how to make a movie kind of plays into like method acting as well as like trying to, you know, ethically uh, write and make a movie about being poor and um, being in a world that you're not used to because he's like a Hollywood executive, Hollywood pro, you know, he's used to the life of luxury. And at first he fails, but then uh, some stuff happens to him along the way that I won't get into since neither of you have seen it, but it's a great film and it really captures research of cinema really well. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice. Great. All right, Chris. What's your number two? <laughs> yeah. Right. What's your number one? <laughs> Fucking hell. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Well, we went know. in that order. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't care about your number one. Go to number two. Well, uh, my number one film, um, we've actually, we all saw this movie together. I think it actually might be the first movie we all saw together. It was in oh, film yeah. history. Um, it's Martin Scorsese's Hugo. Oh, Ooh. now the reason I picked this film, um, is because I, I mean, granted, like there are some aspects of the film that I'm like, honestly, I've just faded from my memory because they were honestly just kind of honestly, like the movie isn't Scorsese's best film, but what I found so meaningful about this movie was that bi- the whole exploration of George Melies and like his r- legacy in the history of film and, the celebration of how like his movies like touched the lives of like so many people, but especially one person. Um, and I don't know. I remember like we were sitting in that theater like years ago now, and we had just watched a trip to the moon, like right before watching Hugo in 3d, by the way. Um, and yeah, I remember just like watching it and thinking like, wow, like movies are awesome. And like, I, I kind of just like, it kind of just like restored my, love for like the magic of cinema i guess um yeah and like yeah like i said the movie isn't like perfect in its construction like i do think like there are some aspects to its narrative and themes that might be a little bit derivative but other than that i do still like feel i do feel like scorsese's love and passion for film is really well articulated in this movie especially through george melies um and yeah, I mean, um, this is a great movie. I mean, I think we all had a good time with it, even though we might have some gripes with the movie itself. Um, what do you guys think of the movie? I, I really don't like this movie. Okay, <laughs> but oh. I really, but I really do enjoy the George Millier sequences mm-hmm. when the flashbacks when they're like actually making those films because I do get those emotions that you were talking about. Right, but like, I cannot stand that little shithead kid Hugo Cabret. Yeah, like, <laughs> you don't like Asa Butterfield running around. It, it's in Paris, but they're all British. It's like, oh, they get the key for the, t- the tanker toys. And I'm it's just like Les like, Rob, where everyone's British for some reason. <laughs> yes, and, oh. stop appropriating uh, French culture, British people. I just swear to fucking <laughs> god, damn it, idiots. No, but like, I don't know. I found, I found the the actual film outside of those flashback sequences and diving into George Millier's past, like pretty, pretty uh, dull. And I honestly disagree. <laughs> oh, what a surprise. No, I really <laughs> do. I, I think, I think the movie's really well done. Like I remember the first time I saw it, I thought it was kind of boring. Mm. Um, But when we watched it on the big screen and I, I'm a big proponent of watching things on the biggest screen as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't been able to do that lately because my sister's been hogging the TV. But shout uh, out, shout out, get off the TV, get off the TV. If you're listening. I, I need to watch <laughs> movies on the bigger screen. Um, but if you watch a movie on a bigger screen, it can really improve your viewing experience. And with Hugo, especially, I remember not just watching it there, but like when I did watch it in like another, like I saw it in another theater setting after that. I I remember being really like blown away by it. I think it's like a magical movie about fatherhood and about trying like trying to find surrogate fathers and random people. Right. Um, and I I love that. And of course, the how can you not like fall in love with his love for movies, either Melier or Cabaret? Mm-hmm. They're both great. But I mean the movie does have its flaws, Chris. Uh, you're right. Yeah. 
Am uh, I right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Ethan, what's, what was your number one pick? All right. So like I said earlier, I sort of progressed my stack through like scale of production. So my number one, I don't know if you've seen it, Chris, but I know Brandon's seen it. Briggsby Bear. Uh, Dude, uh, I forgot that was a movie about making movies. Yes. I forgot. Oh I can't believe I forgot that. This this movie means so much to me. Like, It's the first movie that I saw when my parents dropped me off at college. And like, the whole movie is about Kyle Mooney's character. Shout out to Kyle Mooney, by the way. What a what a transition he made from making internet videos like the ish portal time dudes. Let's do this to like go to SNL and then making this movie. Like that's insane. But mm. it's about getting out of your comfort zone, making friends and um, finding common themes in being creative and creating something. And also I have a soft spot that this movie shot in my hometown, Salt Lake city. So the, the end of this film takes place two blocks away from my house in a theater and I remember just bawling my eyes out in the theater because it, it just the movie just captured everything I wanted my college experience to be and how I want my career to go. You know, I don't know where uh, going to film school and like getting a job in the industry will take me. Maybe I'll just be a nobody. But like, damn, if this film wasn't like inspirational, you know, and yeah, Bracey Bear is my number one. That's an amazing that like. As far as independent movie productions goes, that would probably be my, that is my number one in terms of like how it's filmed and like what it's saying about growing up, like out of my, like it's a coming of age movie about like being arrested in development, arrested development, like when you're young, but like still an adult, but you still have to learn and move on. It's not something like being a teenager or something like this This is like being an adult and learning to become an adult. And I think that's like an imaginative concept to get from whatever movie that was like, it's crazy. Right. Uh, I I love it. Great filmmaking movie. The aesthetics of like just those terrible eighties kid shows, you know? Right. Yeah. It's perfect. But like take it into a modern setting. It's really nostalgic and just, it warms my heart every time I watch it. And the thing is, is you get to actually see like the effects, like the finished effects of like what the film kind of looks like afterwards. Yeah. And in most filmmaking movies, Chris, maybe you can back me up on this. Mm. Like they don't really show the finished products of like people making movies. They'll just show the making of a movie. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. Um, I mean, yeah, I so I haven't seen Bigly Bear. It's definitely in my watch list for sure. Um like you guys both gave it five stars on Letterbox, I think. Yeah. Um, so you know that's incentive enough for me to watch it. Granted, I have no idea what this movie's about. I mean, now I know it's about making a movie, and there's a bear, and it stars Cal Mooney. Like, do not uh, look up anything else. Like, look up going blind. Yeah, I going honestly, blind. it's it's so surprising what it's yeah. like, what it's really about. Yeah. Oh, Claire. It's got Mark Hamill in it. Yeah, Mark Claire Hamill. Danes. Claire Danes. Claire Danes played um, Juliet in. Uh, in Baz Luhrmann's uh, Romeo plus Juliet movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. That was a crazy movie, by the way. What, what that... a fact. <laughs> <laughs> what a poll. Yeah. But yeah, that's right. my first one. All that's right, Brandon. Next time, don't give away your address to people so they know where you live. I'm just saying. Listen, I got I hate mail. Two last blocks time. south. I could be two blocks north. I could do, be two blocks kitty corner. I got You'll never be able to find time. me. They found me. Yeah, like because I literally put my your address in the description. So this one's a this one's a bit more tricky, listeners, gamers. Gamers. Try to try to find my house. And if you do, I'll give you a pot of gold. <laughs> Everyone knows about my infamous pot of gold. Brandon tried to steal from it once. I slapped him on the wrists That's and sent him back to Arizona. <laughs> 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 All right. Brandon, hit us with your number two. All right. I actually watched my number two movie in preparation because I haven't seen it in like two years. I watched the last I night. Ju- I thought you were just going to say, I've actually seen my number two movie. <laughs> no, like, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm uh, like, good. For you. All right. You're watching the movies you're picking. That's good. <laughs> uh, I watched it last night in prep because I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, it, and it's a movie about writing a script. It's very meta about making a movie. And that's Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Uh, great movie. What? Yeah. That's Crazy. about writing a script? Yeah. Yes, actually, believe it or not. I've, I've only seen the first one. 
I don't this really like slashers, but holds up. Yeah, New Nightmare is like a. I don't even know. I, okay, I'm not even gonna like try and like explain what it's about, like in relation to the other movies, because it's, it's. I can do it. It's meta as hell, in terms of like what I know. Like I, I know what it is, but it's just like I don't know if I want to tell Ethan because I feel like if he sees it, he'll his brain will melt. I don't know if he'll like it though, so that's why I want to. Honestly, yeah, maybe maybe, maybe it's worth telling him. Sell I, me on it. Okay, so the movie is basically about the star of the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Her name is uh, Heather Langenkamp. Uh, oh. So her her like character's name is Nancy, right? Yeah. And it's about the star of Nightmare on Elm Street coming back after her being in two of the installments. And she plays herself in the movie. And Wes Craven and Bob Shea, the producer and director of the first movie, are trying to convince her to come back and play one more, uh, play Nancy one more time, essentially. And it's super meta, and it's it's a precursor to Scream in every way, but it also like really like pays attention to like the love of the nightmare movies and the love of the slasher film because the later the later nightmare movies get really really bogged down in comedy like the last two especially before new nightmare are terrible yeah like they're like unwatchable and when it comes down to the this one they tried to make freddy scary again but still have a bit of that signature humor without it overbearing the script and not only do they do that but they make it an original concept with really cool like references to movie making in general and horror movie making and it's phenomenal. Like, mm-hmm. quite possibly one of the most underrated movies ever made. Could I just I, skip to that one? Like, if I've, watch, seen, I've only seen the first one. Watch one and three, and then watch that one. Because okay. you they because she's in three as well, and two doesn't really matter. But watch Dream Warriors, and then skip to New Nightmare, and it stands on its own. It's yeah. great. New Nightmare is great. The um, I remember when I first watched it, because I, I, I had no idea what it was about. Um, I remember like New Nightmare, like just from the title New Nightmare, I was like, oh, so like they're it's like a soft reboot. That's what I thought it was gonna be, you know, because I like, oh, I know like Freddy's Dead was awful. So like it's terrible. Yeah, it's awful. One of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> yeah. So I remember just going like, okay, maybe a fresh start, this will be cool. And then when the movie begins, like you you start to realize, oh, wait a minute. So we're watching them, the actors playing themselves in the movie from the first movie and the second movie. And then and the you just kind movie. of like, yeah, you kind of just get like the sense of like, Oh wow. So they're like, they're self-aware about everything. And also, I mean like just watching like um, Robert England, like play himself and Freddie in the same movie. He's amazing. In he's that movie. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's so good. good. Yeah. Does he play himself playing Freddie meeting him playing Freddie? <laughs> Dude, I'm going to stay tight lipped because I don't want to reveal anything. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, like, that, it's right, crazy. I'm, re- I'm interested. It's yeah. good. And it's, it's, it's really an unconventional good. pick for filmmaking movie because it's kind of, it's about making, trying to make this movie and trying to write the script for this movie. Yeah. But also like, it's a movie all in its own, which is why Chris, I think had a hard time describing it. Yeah. It's, which is I why know. I had to rewatch it. It was like, Holy crap. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap, Louis. So right. Chris. That's nice. Yeah. Chris, All what right. was your number two? So my now number two pick it. was also a movie we watched in film school. Um it was in our film aesthetics class, I think. Um it was 1952's singing in the rain. Ooh. Now, um, I mean, okay, so I think this is kind of similar to Hugo in the sense of like the feeling it gave me when I watched it and like, you know, the whole restoration of movies being like magical and like just feeling so like warm and fuzzy inside after. I mean, like Gene Kelly's always great, but for me, what made this movie was Donald O'Connor playing Cosmo Um, and all the songs like Make Him Laugh or Moses Supposes or just the classic singing in the rain are just incredible. There's so much fun. Um, the the arcs are like holistic and very well established and just so like so fascinating and like there's like seeing how Hollywood transitioned from silent film to they call them talkies at the time um, but yeah so like I had such a great time with this movie um, I remember like just sitting at theater and everyone was just like 
you know, like everyone was like, just like almost like dancing in their seats by themselves. And it was just such a, like a nice time. Um, and yeah, I mean, like the music is just absolutely timeless. The performances are just great. Um, yeah. I mean, like, honestly, like it's kind of like unbelievable to me that this movie was not nominated for best picture when it came out, especially like, you know, it's a movie about making movies. And I know how, like the Academy tends to like shit like that. Um, and yeah, it's just like, it's just total fun. And I don't know. What do you guys think, think of the movie? I think, I think it's really weird that a lot of people in our film, like kind of classes took that, took that class. And we were in a pretty big theater and that seems to be like one of the only movies that they've ever like really responded to. And it's mm-hmm. like a fifties movie. Yeah. I'm not saying like kids don't like old movies, but I mean, the kids we go to school with, no offense to anybody listening. Wait, did you say that was the only movie they were like reacting to? Like in that way. Like it was like joyous. Like I remember that expressly yeah. too. And I love, right. I love seeing in the rain. It's like the, one of the most perfect depictions of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. It's great. It, it, and Ethan doesn't like musicals. Yeah, but and he, he loves, loves it. I, I'm pretty impartial to musicals. Like, it, it's got to take some like great charm, great music, and yeah, this movie. It's impossible to like hate this movie. It's impossible. Everyone's so damn charming. Like, it's so beautiful. Like, it's so pretty to look at. You know, like they, the they capture beautiful the glamour yeah. of Hollywood and like, but also like the determination of getting somewhere. You know, mm-hmm. and it's just, but also like everything's not perfect in this world either you know characters suffer and like you watch them uh have to deal with shit but in the end like oh it's it's such a charming film and i i could watch that any time of the day yeah mm-hmm. any so time of the day yeah any time of the day, day. i can I, I can watch it before breakfast i can watch it before lunch i can watch it before bed i can watch it after bed after bed while you're after sleeping. bed i can watch it while I'm sleeping <laughs> You see, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I'm fucking it's a, saying. It's a great. It movie. reminds me a lot. Of, I actually know La La Land reminds me a lot of Singing in the Rain, like in the sense of like the depiction of like an industry like Hollywood, where you know, like you have the beauty and the grace of it, but also you have this like underlying like tension, and you understand like it's an imperfect and oftentimes a very difficult materialistic industry to navigate. And I think like that's a very important part of Hollywood to acknowledge because, you know, in acknowledging that you start to like dismantle like the components that like make it so, and then maybe you can, we can transition to something less harmful. Um, But no, I do definitely think like the charm of it is so like, like in worldening and, and the acknowledgement of like the underlying, like seedy underbelly, if you will, of um, Hollywood is like really well expressed but yeah, I think that's it's really well done. It's also like really wholesome and genuine, you know. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. you don't really see a lot of Hollywood movies examine both sides of things. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if I can. That's why I said it was kind of like the perf- perfect encapsulation. You know, you have these beautiful like song and dance numbers. You have this depiction of like every aspect of things. Like in the Make Them Laugh number, it's about the the dancing and choreography as much as it's about like the production design of the studio. And in the stunt work in Gene Kelly's earlier work or in the Moses supposes thing, it's about like language and speech people for movies and it's sound in certain sequences. And it really covers all the bases when it comes to cinema, like mm-hmm. quite literally. And that's like the magic of it. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, definitely. All right. Ethan. So my second film, uh, I think it's going to take some convincing because I know we we watched this film together. Oh. I I showed this film to you too. Uh, damn it! I hate you. <laughs> what is it? It's Life Aquatic. Wes Anderson. Oh, oh I I wrote I that down. I knew you were gonna choose that one. I refuse. Oh. Yeah, you refuse because you have no soul. Yeah. Is this the documentary uh, one? Yes, because they it's make re- it's not real. It's not if you real. Could see Ethan's face right now. <laughs> it was like. Well, no, because I'm doing that right now because we're also in the middle of a lightning storm right now. And I just thought someone was crashing their car into my house. So I was a little confused. Sure. Was that you? Are you summoning this lightning storm because you disagree with me? <laughs> I do disagree with this choice as well, Ethan. 
Yeah. I know you do. I know. Well, okay, but explain. Like, go ahead, explain. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, but so Life Aquatic's about like this Jacques Cousteau-esque man and his team. They go on these big excursions in the Mediterranean, all all oceans, all the seven seas, and make nature documentaries. And it's it's about like really depicting the end of this guy's life and uh, realizing that he has a son. Well, he might have a son with Owen Wilson's character. And also that he's driven on a revenge quest to um, avenge his friend who was eaten by this really rare shark. So there's many emotions and plot lines that Bill Murray's Steve Zizou goes through in this film of trying to complete this nature documentary. I, I think it's like the, it, he sets out to do his last one and he has problems with finances and stuff like that. And coming to terms with losing his partner in crime to that shark. And then also coming to terms of being a new father with this, with Owen Wilson's character. And it's just, it just vibes with me, man. Like, I love, I love the visuals of this film. I think it's Wes Anderson's prettiest film. Like the nautical, um, the nautical soundtrack of like the electronic synths and stuff like that. And it's just like, like the sequence when they're trying, when they're on the island trying to save, um, Owen Wilson, I think. And like they're going through and it's like this you know, kind of stuff like that. And it's just like, oh, it's so great. And then the end of this film just like kicks me in the fucking gut, dude. I all these films have me crying. I cry in all three of my films and I lose it when I mean I'm happens. not judging you for crying. I think that's great. You I'm always judge you me. What, do you, what the hell are you talking about? No, I, I, I'm just saying. <laughs> when we watched like, it together and I was crying, you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I did do that. But I was like, I just didn't understand. You explained it so perfectly just now. now I, I mean, like I don't movie. think. Nope. <laughs> I think it's okay. I think it's decent. I think it has its moments. Uh, but as a filmmaking movie, I'm not so sure. What do you mean? It's about I like. I think it's one of the weaker Anderson, too. No. Top tier. Best one. Chris, what do you think? Um, I mean, okay. Um, I, I think I'm somewhere in between you and Brandon um, on this movie. I don't think it's Wes Anderson's best film. Um, I do honestly like, like my favorite film of his is like Grand Budapest and then followed by like Moonrise, Royal Tenenbaums and whatnot. So honestly, like honestly, the life aquatic kind of falls to the side for me and in, in Wes Anderson's like um you know whole thing but also like I think because of that class we took um last year Wes Anderson's whole shtick for me kind of got old um I find myself more and more like not being too interested by his films like French Dispatch I don't know I mean it's gonna have to do something new for me because I think I'm only excited for his movies because of the ensemble yeah, the ensemble he he draws a great ensemble cast. Um, I didn't know this is the West Anderson yeah. hater cast. No, He's we don't right. hate him. No, we don't hate it's him. Just, he does the same thing in every movie. Yeah. Wow, and I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing he does, but it's just like it, I think maybe it's because we watched so many of his movies for so long that I can just got like oh okay with it. Um, I mean, like one of my favorite things he's ever made is the ad he made called come together for h&m while i'm sat on the oh, train with adrian brody train yeah you like that better than most of his movies i think exactly. i gave that a higher ranking than life aquatic actually god damn it <laughs> <laughs> i just checked i, I did I gave, it, I gave it a whole half star higher but um Fuck. no yeah either i do get what you mean when you were talking about like how that movie especially at the end like kind of tears into you hey what's going on what you doing right now listening to the podcast i hope Chris is about to spoil Wes Anderson's Life Aquatic. If you don't want spoilers, skip 30 seconds ahead. You've been warned. Thanks. The um the bit with the shark when like they're all staring there and that, you see how it's affecting Bill Murray's character. Like and you see like the pain in his eyes and like how everyone's kind of observing him and his relationship to this shark and like letting go of like hate and grief, but like accepting like, you know, almost like he has a new family now. Um I did like find that scene like particularly beautiful 
but I, but in all honesty, like the rest of the film kind of weighs it down in at, at least in the way I watch the film. Um, yeah, and like honestly, I think I'm getting. I think I've honestly just gotten tired of Wes Anderson's like, I'm quirky and I'm cool, so film students will love me. Kind of. Uh, thing. Pull out a Wes, let's him pull out a Wes Anderson movie next week for his. Hey, yeah, Chris. Wow. <laughs> honestly, depending on the theme, I might. I might. Grand Budapest is a good film, no matter what. Um, <laughs> Um, Sorry, yeah. Ethan, for bagging on your movie. I apologize. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna see that a lot, folks, in this podcast. I have a feeling. No, not all the time. <laughs> Just most of the time. Just most. Of the time. All right, uh, Brandon. How about you? What's your? Wait, no, 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 no. Oh, it's not me. Oh, wait, no. It's my it's turn. <laughs> no, it's Ethan, right? You just said, like, oh, what's it? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's your final film. <laughs> My bad. I thought, never mind. Okay. <laughs> My last movie we also watched together, all three of us, for a movie night, a particularly great movie night. This one I knew. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, I love this movie. It's, it's by right. Michelle Gondry, yeah, and it's yeah, called yeah. Be Kind, Rewind. All right. There you go. Um, yeah. This, this movie is, in my opinion, amazing because, like Ethan's Briggsy B. Bear, it's like the depiction of independent filmmaking and what like imagination does with with people who don't have a lot. So right. it's about these people who have to save their video store by remaking old movies that they accidentally erased. And it's very surreal. It's very creative. It's very low budget. And for me, it's great at capturing the transition from physical media to digital media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I do remember like – so. Um, for those of the audience who like, actually, yeah, none of you guys know, but when um, when I discovered that this was going to be our topic, I wrote down three films that I had expected Brandon to choose. Um, so one of the immediate ones I thought of was Be Kind Rewind because I know he loves this movie. Um, the other two that I thought of that I'm actually kind of surprised he didn't pick, but I do now that I've heard his selection, I get why. I thought he was going to pick Cinema Paradiso and The Player. Oh. Um, I was going to pick the player. I was, yeah. but I didn't. Yeah. But um, Be Kind Rewind, like, I remember when we watched it, like, it was, like, like yeah, Ethan and I gave it, like, three and a half. Like, both of us gave it three and a half. But, like, I, like Brandon's description of, like, how this movie is, like, a great depiction of, like, just, like, people, like, making movies, literally, and on, like, such a small scale, but it also meaning so much to so many different people and, like, a community and how it unifies a people it was very like meaningful to see like how like Jack Black and um, yes, I, yeah. Um, like how, like how they unite like their entire neighborhood and in like this shared like love for movies. We also had a, a legendary moment where, <laughs> with, with, um, oh my God. with Gummo. Um, so Ethan, do you want to explain this whole Gummo? Oh, thing? wow. Okay. Put this on me. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah. Um, so in our film analysis class, I believe, right? Film analysis. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep. We experienced uh, Harmony Curran's Gummo for the first time together. We are sitting in our little screening room holding hands, pissing ourselves. <laughs> Chris almost vomited. And it was a real experience, one that we'll never forget. We, we call ourselves yeah. the Gum Bros because of it. <laughs> because of that traumatizing <laughs> experience that we went through. It was like... We're itty bitty sophomores, like experiencing experimental cinema for the first time, and it was like, yeah, it was crazy. But then we watched this film like one or two weeks later after that, and somebody I don't I don't remember who just spotted the Gummo VHS in the bookstore. I think it was, it was me. Brand. It was Brandon. And, you know, and it was like a brief yeah, second. Like, Gummo fell off the shelf. <laughs> Gummo. Pause it. We rewinded it, and we lost our shit. <laughs> And we, yeah, like, it was like literally frame by frame. Yeah, and okay, there's it. Gummo. Uh, it's 20 minutes and 36 seconds. Uh, Gummo makes another yeah. appearance. At <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it came up twice. And I remember like the first time when it happened, like, like, cause like Brandon, you said you saw it, but you were like maybe like 95% sure that was it. So you weren't sure yet. Then we did the frame by frame playback. And then when we got a clear look at it, like, I think Ethan like rolled back on like the sofa. I fell to the floor. Brandon ran through the kitchen screaming. Like, God. It was like it was haunting us, but it was so funny. Like this, like that alone, like is like a great moment for this movie. 
And, <laughs> yeah, and like just like, but like that's not the only reason like this movie's like so much fun. Like honestly, like it's just like it's a very feel good movie. Um, and yeah, it's just like a good time. I mean, Ethan, what do you think of Be Kind Rewind? Yeah, I I can't remember much from the movie like in the beginning or the end, but like. Mm-hmm. The, the, the beginning and the end don't really stand out to me but that that second act when they're making the movies and like coming together and people are like actually starting to appreciate what they're doing and they want to help it's it's incredibly heartwarming and just like it's yeah. inspire it's again inspiring you know like i want to go out and do that you know they make it seem like so much fun like they remake like robocop and uh i think they remake et maybe i don't remember they, they do. do they remake 2001 Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters RoboCop, yeah. yeah. Rush Hour. Oh yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah, Rush Hour. That was funny. <laughs> uh, Rush Hour two, I think maybe two. But yeah, but, yeah. yeah I, I love That's that. Movie. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea because it's so weird, but like, I fuck with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gondry has like such like a weirdness to him, but it's so charming across all of his movies, like Science of Sleep or Eternal Sunshine. Like those are like much like Be Kind Rewind. They're so magical yes. in terms of like how he executes it green hornet green kind of hornet is, oh my like, gosh like, i always kind of forget he does green kind of like hornet. His, oh my god yeah every time i see that movie i'm just like wait he michelle gondry's i mean like hornet. christoph waltz plays like i don't like he wields like a gun that has two barrels i don't even know how to describe that that movie uh, but yeah like that like gondry's a crazy director but like, he's like they're just the right kind of crazy all right well that was my number three my final one chris mm-hmm. where are you at all right. All right, so my number three, um, I don't think we saw this together, but we've all seen it. it. Like, I remember, I think I saw it maybe like the beginning of last semester or something. Um, and it's one of those movies that um, has like, like when I first saw it, it was like, oh, it's good. But then as I grew, like I grew as like someone who understood film and loved movies and whatnot, I started to like appreciate this movie a lot more. And that's 2019's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, so, yeah, I know, like, it might not appear as, like, that orthodox of a, like, movies about making movies um, film. Because, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, honestly, like, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood's kind of a difficult movie to to place into a genre. Because it's, it's kind of, like, just, like, overarchingly showing what Hollywood was like in 1969 and what was going on at the time. Um, whether that was like the transition for a character like Rick Dalton from TV into cinema and like having to adjust to that and what that, what a difficult process that was, that was like. Um, but like, even then, like the whole, like everything with like Sharon Tate and Bruce Lee, um, and all that is just like, it's so much fun and so charming and like how, um, like, it's just like a, such a fun time in the history of filmmaking um and honestly like leonardo dicaprio and um brad pitt like their their dynamic is so great in this movie um i love the bits where like i mean like leo has always been known for being able to play like angry really well and that scene where he runs into his trailer and he's so mad at himself for messing up a scene like that is just such a hilarious moment for me yeah how many trailers did he demolish yeah and like that that big payoff at the end with the flamethrower and like the remixing of history was just so much fun. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think of this? I, Brian, I know you like this movie. I, I um, really, I, I really like this movie too. I think we all agree that like the more we think about it, it gets better. The, the better it gets. Yeah. It's yeah. It's one of Tarantino's like it's one of his slowest films, but that it totally works with the themes Absolutely. of the film where it's it's very reflexive of not even of just tarantino's past as a filmmaker you know coming to terms with him coming to the end of his career but also of just like yeah how hollywood has come to be and like where he like where tarantino believes is like the golden age of what the golden age of just movie making you know and like stars he gets two of the the last like actual movie stars you know people are saying that from the 90s well people are saying that like the, the star doesn't sell the movie anymore. And a de- like true. a decade ago, people would line up to go see Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio movies, but I don't think so anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. Which is why, like, their characters are so great. Um, 
I do think that like Margot Robbie's character was a little bit misadvertised, you know, mm-hmm. where there's not really enough of her. But then again, her character does and play incredibly well into that once upon a time aspect of the film. Right. Some people got really upset with how it rewrote history with Bruce Lee's character mm-hmm. and the ending, of course. Right. But yeah, we we went into a lengthy discussion in our in our With, uh, yeah. film theory class about how Tarantino is he's not trying to like offend anybody he's trying to show this is this is how we wish it was you know this is how this is how Cliff Booth um sees uh Bruce Lee you know this is not how he really was this is a once upon a time this is a this is a, a fantasy you know and it's yeah oh uh, the sa- the soundtrack is so good like Mm-hmm. it's it's incredibly just i watched this movie on thanksgiving with my parents and i couldn't think of like a better one it just it just fits that vibe you know yeah, yeah. but yeah it gets it it's I a just, great movie i it, it captures this the transitional period from pre-1960 cinema to post-1960 cinema in a really interesting way mm-hmm. because a lot of people i don't think realize if they're not film students that before 1960 movies were very different from the way they are today Mm -hmm. and i think that was a very foundational time for concepts and content because the world was going through a bunch of things such as the civil rights movement and the vietnam war stuff like that and i think that this movie captures all of those excellently well as well as like the filmmaking behind i mean the movie as much as it is like making uh, making movies is not like focused on it necessarily Mm. as a as a topic but i think it definitely captures like some of the aspects of the filmmaking like stunt because that's the big thing it's about stuntmen you know it's not about them making their perspective projects although there is that one scene with dicaprio in that western movie and that is Mm. quite possibly the best scene in that movie technically that's a tv show or or the end that's the TV, yeah, TV the, show. the Western show. That's what right. I meant. Yeah, that. yeah, Bounty Law. I think it was called. Well, that that was yeah, his yeah. show, but he was fake guest starring on another one. Oh, but yeah, he for the, the pilot yeah. episode or something like that. The, um, yeah, there's a there's a scene in that movie where Leonardo DiCaprio is playing this like very despicable character, and um, they're doing like a dolly shot, but like we're we're watching the film as though we're like actually watching that movie. Like the perspective of the audience is the camera in that setting. And like there's a bit where he messes up his line and then he he's like, ah, okay, can we cut? Please can we cut? And you hear the director and the boom comes into frame for a second because you know the the crew is resetting and everything. You see the and then he says, Okay, back to once, and then the dolly like moves back, we move with it. And like, yeah, it's just like such a like engrossing um like dive into filmmaking that you know i think it's just like it's all just so much glitz and glamour and so much fun um but yeah i think it's very 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 sophisticated as well as in its like depiction of like you know how difficult of an industry it can be um yeah and like honestly that's all there is to it i mean yeah i love this movie i harbor Um, resentments with it though you have resentments that girl yeah because that girl remember what girl the one i matched with online no nobody sorry i don't keep up with your tinder history brand oh sorry okay no (laughs) okay it's fine do you want to fill all the she's from once upon a time do you want a doctor (laughs) yeah go ahead yeah yeah sure all right so interesting story Uh, brand i can't believe her feet are that big anyways um no. yeah. <laughs> so is it my number three now yeah, yeah. your final movie. all right my final movie wait do you boys do you guys hear that hear that music coming in no no i don't we don't life's like a movie write your own ending keep believing keep pretending we've done just what we've set out to do it's the muppet movie very first Muppet uh, movie. Come on, oh, boys! You know, you know my my love, my passion. We, yeah, we know. I know. I was you there. You were there. Brandon and I watched twelve Muppet movies in a row. 
during finals week. Finals week. Oh. And it was <laughs> it was the best. It was Good. the most But it wasn't the great Muppet Caper, you know. That movie's amazing. That movie's amazing, but like again, this movie just like makes my heart soar in the air, bruh. Oh my god. <laughs> I love I love these characters. I love their goal of getting to Hollywood and signing that rich and famous contract. I love the music in this movie. It's probably my, it's my favorite musical. I'll tell you that. Um, and yeah, just, it's so, it's filled with so much wonder and hope and creativity and friendship <laughs> between Kermit and the gang. And I just, I could watch this movie whenever and the end sequence where they try to remake the Muppet movie, but then it all comes apart, but it doesn't matter because they're here. They did it. They've achieved their dream. They're making, they're making stuff together and just, Oh my God. I honestly thought you were going to go with the Muppet wizard of Oz because that's about remaking wizard of Oz no. with Tarantino pitching the idea. Fuck no, that movie. <laughs> that movie's <laughs> trash. <laughs> No, but the Muppet movie is really good. I remember it was we started out on a high note. It it kind of was a slightly like disappointing rewatch for me because I, I remember watching it and being like, this isn't as good as I remember it being, but it's still good. Like it's still a very good movie. Uh it definitely captures like that the aspirations to be a big Hollywood star really well. And I love that. It's very optimistic. It's very joyful. And Ethan's right. A lot of the music in that movie is really good. Yes. But, I mean, there are better songs in right. the entire series. Oh my but God. For the first time ever. It's so good. Yeah, you're right. It. It's a good movie. I'm thriving. Chris. I don't know about, I don't know if I agree on this list, but. Chris, have you seen this movie? <laughs> um, you're talking about, you are talking about the 1979 one with James Farley like, as director. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think, I, if I remember correctly, I've seen this one. Honestly, it's been a many, many years since I've seen a Muppet movie. I honestly think of the last, like when I saw this movie for the, like the one and only time I've seen this was like when I was like seven or eight. Mm-hmm. So over 10 years ago. And c- quite frankly, I have, I don't remember that much about it. Um, like I honestly don't think I have, I remember enough to form a great opinion on it. Um, yeah, but like I mean, I do totally like. Rem- I do definitely remember like the music being a lot of fun, um, and like yeah, that like as Brandon was talking about like the whole adventure to you know and desire to achieve like fame and fortune and like just like the the warm feeling this movie gives people um, is always just so much fun. Um, I mean, like you know, this was like a movie that like made me remember like Kermit's voice you know, it became like a legendary piece of iconography for me. Yeah. Um, granted, like, you know, I'm not as like, I think it was maybe just because of like my upbringing, but like, I'm, I don't know very much about the Muppets. And I, I think this might be the only Muppets movie I've seen. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like for the marathon, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, for, I forgot where I was, but I remember like walking in and out of the apartment every now and then and just being like, oh, they're still like, they're still seven. on the couch watching it, the Muppets. Still writing uh, their papers. Yeah, you guys are writing papers. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Bit of a side note, but I was thinking of making a letterbox list of um, people of um, films that quote unquote take Manhattan, but the only ones I could think of were uh, Muppets Take Manhattan and Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> oh my god, two very different films. Don't <laughs> so, yeah. two bad two, movies. Yeah, Muppets Take Manhattan. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean Joey Probably. and Tori like takes Man- takes Manhattan, don't they? That's because they like the baby song. Mama, poopy, shoo, shoo, wah, wah, wah. That's like not even good music. Come Brandon, on. can I turn what you just said into my ringtone? Yeah. Sure. I, I like what you just did. That was, <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> I'm better than the Muppets, okay? Let's see. I write my own music. All right. But yeah, that's my number three. All right. Well. My f- big finale. Good movie. Uh, let's just, let's go around one more time saying our three. And, uh, after that, we'll get into making our quintessential stack. So Brandon, you want to kick us off with your three? I had Sullivan's Travels, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, and Be Kind Rewind. Okay. Chris? I had 
Martin Scorsese's Hugo, um, Singing in the Rain, and Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time, well, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All right. And I had Brigsby Bear, The Life Aquatic with Steve Sazu, and The Muppet Movie. So those are I can tell you one of those is not making the list. Pro- probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know which one yeah, too. Yeah, you do, you motherfuckers. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Let's so, what's your like? Like, you gotta like. Okay, what would you guys say is your number one? Like, this has to be on the list. I'm going to like put a gun in my mouth if it's. Whoa. Well, I'm not that. I'm violent, not that violent. Okay. I was gonna say if I don't get one of these movies on the stack. I didn't get any last week. Remember. We're keeping county. Keep count. We know. I will I'm going to scream, scream, scream. Who lordy am I gonna scream if I don't get any of my films this time? But that's not how how, the how do we want to format this stack? Like do we want to do it like Brandon's? I don't think I want to do it like Brandon's because I don't think I want to do it like mine either. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Sick. We're, we're on the same page, I guess. So we're not putting any of Brandon's films in this list this week. No, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think I would be happy including Wes Craven's New Nightmare or Beacon Rewind on our list, but I can cross out Sullivan's Travels. I think that's just a great movie. Yeah, I, I was. Really I would be. One. I would be happy. I would be happy with either of those. Um, I am much more partial to New Nightmare. Um, I don't know. I think it's a great like piece of like it's like a weird like relic in the middle of like such a crazy like season of slasher films in Hollywood's history. Yeah. But it's like it's so like strangely charming. And I think it fits. I definitely think it fits. Um, okay. It's not an orthodox like you know like this is a movie about making movies, but I think that's like kind of the fun of it. It's just kind of like it's a different. Weird, a weird thing in a very, very like traditional, like lineup of movies. Okay, let me let me pitch let me pitch know. a stack to you. Okay. So, I think one that all three of us like we genuinely agreed on. I think Singing in the Rain has to be in this list. Oh, I, I would agree. agree. I agree. That movie is quintessential Hollywood. I think I think that's like our big Hollywood movie, and then uh-huh. I think our indie should be Brigsby Bear. And then we should have New Nightmare. What do you think about that? I can get behind that list, but I want yeah, that different order. So I think we should do Brigsby Bear first, New Nightmare second, Singing in the Rain third. So you're like talking about building up to building like up, that building up the scale of Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. What do you think of that? I could get behind that. Yeah. I could get I behind that. Yeah. Chris, I haven't think? seen Briggs, I haven't seen Bigsby Bear, so it's hard for me to form an opinion on that. But I do trust you guys, like with the five stars. You, Honestly, I, I have I have a weird feeling that I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this movie and give it a four, and you guys are gonna kill Chris me. when you get back. But I won't, uh, I won't kill, kill you. you. <laughs> I don't kill people, Chris. What? Yeah. Come on, dude. <laughs> but Chris, when you get back to America, when we get back to California, I got that Briggsby Bear yeah. Blu-ray. I'll lend it to you, bro. All right. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can watch. It. Um. But yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, I can get behind that if, like, because I trust you guys. And then New Nightmare, great pick. Singing of the Rain is quintessential. Honestly, I'm okay with that. Um, and it's just a unique marathon. Like, look at yeah. those three movies. There's just so, so many different. genres. Yeah. 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 I do like, yeah, kind of like horror, musical, and comedy, drama. Yeah. I think it also, like, does a gr- I think one thing, like, we balance pretty well with this list is, like, it encapsulates the love and joy of cinema and what it does for people, but also, like, at least to some extent, gently gently touches on like the underlying like you know um you know part of hollywood that might be a little bit less pleasant but something that's worth but that's also something that's worth acknowledging and that's something i think that's very important for our list but yeah i think we did that pretty well okay. all right let's let's do our Turn stuff it down all right let me start off with a movie i've actually seen i'm like last week <laughs> okay <laughs> so our number one in our stack breaks me bare Fantastic indie film. Kyle Mooney shines as a star. I want I need to see him in more movies. It's heartwarming as hell. It's inspirational for any new filmmakers. I think this is a must watch. Number one, Breaks Me Bear. Branded. Right. Number two, we've got Wes Craven's New Nightmare. 
a very meta epilogue to the uh, Nightmare series. It kind of works on its own, and it's a mid-budget movie. It was only produced for like $8 million. So as for horror movies, it's very cheap, but it's also very high concept, and it really captures the productions of movie making fantastically. And I cannot stress this enough, underrated. And our third film, Chris. And our third film is Stanley – oh, God, I'm going to mess up his last name – Donan and Gene Kelly's 1952 Singing in the Rain. Um, an amazing film dealing with um, a season in Hollywood's history. I think it's like the fall of 1927 where silent film was making their difficult transition to sound. Um, a very charming film starring uh, Gene Kelly, Donald O'Connor, and Debbie Reynolds. Um, beautiful choreography, incredible singing, uh, great story, excellent payoff, wonderful narrative, extremely sophisticated, but still lighthearted themes. Um, yeah. And just a completely accessible, but also just like very, very sophisticated film. Um, and yeah, like beautiful, beautiful film, um, would cannot recommend this movie enough. All right. And that yeah, there we everyone have. is our stack of movies about making movies. Brandon is dabbing right now because he's <laughs> flossing, he's dabbing, he's jumping up on the bed and No, I don't I don't know how oh to my floss. God. I don't know how to This kid, yeah, he's like a kid on Christmas dab, morning. Boy does this man love movies. <laughs> I love this stack. I think this is better than the pandemic stack. I, I do too. Yeah, I like this stack. Yeah. I just, this might be our greatest episode yet. <laughs> <laughs> can that happen every time please uh, i hope so right. it'd be great if we just keep going up from here yeah we're going up from here we're not peaking yep. yeah all right and that's the show that's the show everyone yeah thanks for listening to stacked episode two um if you want to follow us anywhere i'm going to put all of our links to all of our little social medias chris finally got a twitter which is Woo, woo. We've been begging him for years, and he finally got it, and he loves it, and I'm glad. But yeah, everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Stacked. Bye!